Good morning, church. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us just take a moment and prepare our hearts for worship and just slow us down a bit as we reflect upon this sacred space and time in which we are about to receive God's presence. So let us just take a moment. Amen. Praise the Lord. A couple of announcements before we continue in the service. There is uh, a special envelope in your uh, bulletin. Uh, we've done this uh, last week. We're also doing it this week and I think one more week. Uh, it is for Hurricane Helene relief. Uh, I think it's going to go to probably both uh, the hurricane reliefs, but we're collecting it as the Global Methodist Church. We're going to send it to the Global Methodist Church and then they're going to send it to the proper uh, relief agencies down in those areas. Uh, so if you can give, uh, please uh, try to give. There's great need there. Uh, we've already raised uh, a lot. I, I can't, I, I think. Congregation gave about $2,000. We got a $500 donation from Mission to Mission. So okay, so we're, we're so far at $2,500 just for one week. So that's, that's a wonderful uh, uh, offering. So. Uh, so we're going to do this for a couple more weeks, so let's try to match that this week and, and uh, just give all of our efforts to that. There is some meetings that are coming up this week. Uh, just to mark your calendars, tomorrow at 6 p.m. is our safety team meeting. Uh, if you are part of the safety team or if you want to be a part of the safety team, please try to join us at 6 p.m. tomorrow. We'll have... Um, uh, former district attorney Dave Lozier, he's going to come speak and just talk about uh, safety in, in buildings. He's done a lot of work in uh, preparing safety plans for, for schools and uh, other public places. So it would be, uh, he's going to come and, and talk to us about little things that we can do to just kind of help with security of, of our church building. So please try to come at 6 p.m. tomorrow. Right after that meeting is a trustee meeting. So if you're part of the trustees, please come for that meeting as well at 7 p.m. Tuesday, that we only do this once a year, we're having our nominating committee meeting at 11 a.m. So if you're on the nominating team, you probably got an email this week. You probably forgot you were even on it. Uh, but if you're on it, uh, you got to come out at 11 a.m. And what we do is we basically gather as many names as we can for those that would like to serve on committees next year. So if you'd like to serve on a committee, uh, please come see me, uh, contact the office in some way. If you don't want to serve on a committee, you still probably might get a call from me or someone from the nominating committee. So please just kind of uh, lift that up in prayer and search your heart. Uh, we got a lot of things going on in the church that lead a lot, need a lot of organization and we need your help on these committees. Um, there, of course, don't forget about um, this afternoon, we have our Jumbotron football. Now, I have heard from a few people that they're not going to come because they can't trust themselves in the sanctuary watching a football game and the language that might come out of their mouths. And so, so we have moved it, and also for the, for the sanctity of the space, too. Uh, we have moved it over to the chapel. And so if something happens in the chapel, you can easily come over and repent and then go back. Uh, so we're going to be at the chapel. So please, at 4 o'clock, we got free. Uh, we're, we're just asking for a free will offering. For We got wings and pizza, and it's going to be a fun time to just... Uh, uh, I think we're going to do some trivia too, some Bible trivia, black and gold teams and see who wins at the end. And, and so it's just going to be a fun time of fellowship and also to watch the Steeler game. So come on out for Jumbotron football. Uh, I think that may be all, is it, am I missing something? Yeah, 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 yeah. What's that? Oh yes. Um, UMW. UM, what's 
Can you please, can you please give me the announcement for you and W? Saturday, 11 o'clock, the theme is the spirit of Halloween. We will be decorating pumpkins, not party, decorating. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, and lunch will be provided. Okay, 11 o'clock on Saturday. UMW meeting, cafe room, decorating pumpkins. So please try to join us. Um, also, Kathy has something from the SPRC. <laughs> Good morning. Um, as um, we've been talking about, today is Pastor Appreciation Sunday. Um, and we want to uh, uh, take just a few minutes to um, tell Pastor Gary how much we um, appreciate him. You know, pastors are called to serve in many roles including teachers, counselors, spiritual leaders of their church. The hard work of a pastor goes beyond speaking at the pulpit every Sunday to other meaningful opportunities such as missions and mentorship. The pastor's there during life's major moments from the joys of new beginnings to unfortunately the sorrow of loss. And we know that pastors are often the first to arrive in times of crisis and the last to leave, bringing comforting words and prayers. They continually strive to shepherd their flock, just as God promises in Jeremiah 3.15. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. A pastor's commitment is a testament to their faith and dedication to God's calling in their lives. If you consult the dictionary, you'll see that a pastor is often defined as an intermediary between the people and God. But Pastor Gary, the congregation of New Brighton Methodist Church doesn't need a dictionary to tell us the meaning of your role, since you so wonderfully define the word with your life. And to Michelle, you're not just the pastor's wife. You're the smile, the warmth, the comfort, the faithful, prayerful, patient, more helpful than you could ever know partner to the man God's called to labor for him. He couldn't do this without you beside him. Pastor Gary, in addition to enjoying your sermons from the pulpit, we appreciate the sermon that you live out right before our eyes. We're holier, we live holier lives because of your teaching. Barb? Pastor Gary, we are thankful for your faithful teaching of God's word. Each week, we have had the privilege of sitting under your faithful teaching of the Bible. Your preaching has been like a slow gospel drip that God has used to saturate our hearts with a greater love for him. Thank you for teaching us about the beauty and majesty of Jesus Christ, the foolishness of sin, and the faithfulness of our Lord, who always keeps his promises. Pastor Gary, we are thankful for your Christ-like conduct. You may not know this, but your conduct has helped us, has helped us better understand what it means to be a godly man. By the way you greet members on Sunday morning or interact with your family, we have learned just as much, if not more, from your character as your teaching. Thank you for walking with integrity in an age where so many live double lives. Pastor Gary, we are thankful for how you remind us that there is a greater aim in life. Thank you for modeling what it means to live for the sake of God's kingdom and not our own. You have reminded us that the most important thing is that we live for Christ. No matter what comes our way, in a culture that tells us to live for ourselves, you have shown us that there is a better way. As I fall down. <laughs> better you than me. <laughs> Pastor Gary, we are thankful for your courageous faith. Thank you for not being afraid to call us to repentance and to challenge us toward greater faith in Christ. Thank you for continuing to stand in God's word, 
even though you may receive criticism for doing so. You have modeled courageous faith, faith for us despite challenging circumstances. Pastor Gary, we are thankful for your patience with us. Sometimes we are hard-headed. I can't believe I'm saying that. <laughs> Sometimes we are apathetic. Other times we are fully committed. Thank you for continuing to patiently care for us through, your, through the mountains and the valleys of our life. Pastor Gary, we are thankful for your sincere love for us. We are grateful that our church truly feels like a family. In hospital visits, counseling sessions, and members' meetings, you have shown that you really care for us. Thank you for modeling sacrificial and sincere love by the way you serve us each week. Thank you. Pastor Gary, we're thankful for your steadfast leadership. In an age of confusion and polarization, thank you for being a con consistent voice that leads us towards Christ. In recent years, you've had to tackle issues that no one could have prepared for. Thank you for remaining steadfast and faithful, even in uncertain times. Pastor Gary, we are thankful for your vulnerability and your perseverance through suffering. We know that over the years you have experienced hardship. Thank you for showing us that Christ is your shepherd too. Thank you, even through your suffering, you have reminded us of these are but momentary afflictions which pale in comparison to the glory that awaits us. Pastor Gary. What, what did he say? He said you gave her a mic. <laughs> there you go. Pastor Gary, we are thankful that we can call you pastor because hardcore devil stomping ninja isn't an official job title. Holy enough to know better, funny enough to still have a good time. We love you. Okay. Some sort of garment. <laughs> this, this pastor has an awesome congregation. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. You didn't. You didn't have anything to do with that. <laughs> okay. It says this pastor has an awesome congregation. <laughs> um, right now, I'd like to invite um, Tom and Kitty Woodski up for a pres uh, special presentation. Oh, jeez. Are you going to do it right from the? Come on down. Okay. <laughs> Is this food? Yeah. Oh, wait a second. No, you think that might be money, but that's not money. Okay, but it's very heavy. Okay. okay and you might want to put the bag down and reach in and pull that out. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of like putting your hand down your Christmas stocking and pulling out a piece of coal. Okay, it's a brick. It's a brick. <laughs> okay. Oops. Let me tell you about this brick. In March 2023, a secret underground tunnel believed to be part of the Underground Railroad was unearthed during excavation at the Merrick Art Gallery property. At that same time, the underground foundation of our early church, previously built on this same property in 1866, was found. 
This building and property were later purchased by Dempster Merrick, who wanted to expand his gallery. When you leave the service this morning, glance over at the gallery and you will actually see the original bricks, very possibly ma manufactured in our local New Brighton brickyards that were salvaged from our church building and reused to build Merrick's additional space. We are honored today to present to you with one of those original bricks, which is not only a reminder of the early history of the foundation of our congregation in New Brighton, but also a reminder of the foundation you are building as our leader and pastor of the New Brighton Methodist Church. God bless you. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Bless you. Oh, thank you so much. I don't even know what to say. Thank you very much. Bless you all. Bless you all. And it's all, and my whole ministry is, is to God's glory. I do none of this without the Lord. And, and the Lord has worked in my life from the very beginning. And uh, I just praise him. And, and, I, and I, I praise the Lord for you all. Every single day I, I come and I pray for you all. I really do. And I just thank God for the blessing that I have this church to serve the Lord in and uh, the blessing of this congregation. And uh, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. So thank you all. Thank you so very much. And I still can't believe you, you gave a, a, a mic to Debbie. But, <laughs> <laughs> but bless you all. Bless. Yes, I gave one to Kim too. But I am so thankful and overwhelmed and bless you all. Thank you. I, I couldn't imagine when I came here five years ago, and I say this every time you move as a United Methodist pastor, and thankfully in the global church we don't move as much, so I might be able to be here for quite some time. But, but in the Methodist church when I did get moved here, and I say this all the time, you don't want to move. You know, because you, you make friends and you, you, you create a family in your previous church and then you come and, and you're serving and you don't know anybody. And uh, it didn't take long before I felt like all of you were part of my family too. And, and I love serving as your pastor and all glory goes to God. So thank you. Bless you all. I'm going to cherish this. Thank you forever. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Like 20 extra minutes on the sermon today. I'm <laughs> fired up. Fired up for the Lord. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Through candy. Through candy. Oh, yes. If I do. <laughs> If I, if I have a good sermon, I get candy at the end of it. So, 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 so y'all think I'm back there just being real nice to everybody. I, I, I'm just waiting for the candy. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Joan. <laughs> All right. Let us begin the service with our call to worship followed by our hymn of praise. Let us rise. Our Lord, God's mercies never end. They are new every single morning, and we gather in gratitude today that our faith may increase. Take delight in the Lord. Take delight in God who is with us wherever we go. Trust God even when there is trouble in the land. We will commit all our ways to God. We will wait patiently for answers to our prayers. We will trust in God. By God's grace, we are gathered for worship today. In God's love, we are no longer exiles and strangers. Amen.
Amen. You may be seated. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do. Amen to that. Amen. There's a, a before we get into the prayer time, I just got to share something. We had a, uh, at the nine o'clock service, I, I, I lifted up my, my, my grandson in prayer. He had an infection that he's been dealing with throughout the week, and uh, he just hadn't seemed to be getting better, and they're, you know, they're giving him antibiotics and things. And, and uh, so uh, I lifted him up in prayer at the 9 a.m., and as I'm talking through the prayer, as I'm, I'm praying the, the pastor prayer, I get in, you know, you shut your phone off and you get the little vibration. And I'm thinking, you know, I hope this isn't my mother, that she should know what I do on Sunday mornings for a living, because uh, she has been known to call me at odd times. Uh, but uh, so I came and I sat back down during uh, one of Cassie and Elwood's songs, and uh, I looked, and it was my uh, daughter in law saying, Oh, he, he seems to be finally getting better. Uh, so right in the midst of that prayer. So I just take that as an answer to prayer and, and just a praise, uh, just a lot of answered prayers for a little guy this week. And uh, so think of that when we go to prayer for all of these people. The Lord does work in our lives. He does answer prayers. There is power in prayer. There's power in all of our prayers for all of these people. I don't know how that works, but it works. And uh, so... Uh, let us not forget, uh, especially Barr Cooperstein, he's a 21-year-old volunteer paramedic who's still being held hostage by Hamas. There's been no word on what has happened to him, so pray for him and his family. Uh, just a horrible, horrible time for them. Pray for all of these, the Rombold family, the Mathis family, who are still dealing with the death of loved ones. Uh, also, Pray for all of these that are affected by weather. There's so many that have lost loved ones, have lost property. Uh, we need to continually be in prayer for them as well as all of those in these war zones uh, in Ukraine and Israel and uh, all over the, the world where there is war and conflict. Uh, keep innocent people protected. Just call upon God's holy angels to come and protect them. Pray for all of these that uh, long list of names of those with health concerns, take them home with you each and every week when you go to prayer, lift them up by name, especially for little Sammy. Uh, we're praying for little Sammy, a four-month-old who needs uh, some heart surgery, so we're continuing to lift him up in prayer. Uh, please keep uh, our homebound members uh, those who can't be with us every week or military members that can't be with family or anybody else that's living far away that uh, we wish were with us right now, right here. Uh, let's keep them in prayer too and those that deal with that loneliness. Um, so let us go to silent prayer for these and then I will close. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come before you today with our hearts just full of gratitude, thanking you, Lord, for your endless uh, love and mercy and grace that 
uh, you give to our lives. We are so grateful, Lord, for all of the blessings that you pour into our daily lives, the, the gift of life, the gift of family and friends and fellowship, and also, Lord, just the opportunity, the opportunity to gather in your name, praise your name, Lord, and to just call upon your glory to fall upon us, Lord. We praise you today for guiding us uh, through all of the challenging times, but also leading us into joy each and every week. That is the true blessing that we find living as followers of Christ. And we are so truly thankful. Thank you, Lord, for being our refuge and our strength. We are blessed beyond measure. We also, Lord, humbly ask uh, that you continue to watch over us, to provide for our needs, to guide our steps, bless our families, bless our church, bless our community, bless our world. Let your presence, Lord, be felt in, in homes, in work, in the hearts and souls of every individual that you create. We also lift up to you all of those from our family, Lord, that are in great need, that are connected to this family of faith. All of those names, Lord, that we print in our bulletin, as well as those who we may have forgotten. We especially lift up to you, Bar Cooperstein. We lift up to you, uh, little Sammy, we're lifting up to you all of those that are in the path of these hurricanes and dealing with uh, the destruction that they caused. We're praying for many, Lord, that are dealing with health issues. And we lift them all up to you, Lord, whether it be a physical or emotional or spiritual trouble, Lord, we lift it all up to you and ask you to touch them with your healing hand and restore them. Lord, you are the great healer, and we trust in your power to make all things whole. And Father, we also come before you, Lord, with repentant hearts. We ask you for forgiveness, Lord, for when we have fallen short of your will. We ask you to cleanse us from, your, from our sins and to make us new, Lord, each and every day. And you help us to turn away from what is wrong and to walk in the paths of your righteousness. Not our own feelings of what is good, but what we know you say is good. Following your example of love and grace and forgiveness and truth. We also pray, Lord, for your protection. Keep us, Lord, and those we love away from temptation and evil and harm. Guard our hearts and minds from anything that seeks to pull us away from you. May you cover us with your peace and guide us always to walk in faith. And we lift all of this up to you in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
First reading for this morning comes from the book of 1 Kings, and this is verse, 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Uh, let us rise for the reading of the Lord. When David's time to die drew near, he charged his son Solomon, saying, I am about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong, be courageous, and keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes and his commandments and his ordinances and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses, so that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. Then the Lord will establish his word that he spoke concerning me. If your heirs take heed to their way to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail you a successor on the throne of Israel, says the word of God for the people of God. At this time, will the ushers please come forward with this morning's offering. Would you please bow your head for our prayer of dedication? We are grateful to you, O God, for the faith we have inherited. We give thanks for the courage and faithfulness of ancestors who suffered for the gospel that we might know your love. We join with them in putting our trust in you. May we match their generosity and self-discipline, seeking above all else to know your will and to do your will. To that end, we dedicate our offerings. Amen. Would you please remain standing for Psalm 127, verses 1 through 2. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the guard keeps watch in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives sleep to his beloved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated.
have carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to I run to the Father, I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I run to the Father again and again and again. Amen. It's nice to have Cassie Collins and Elwood Brandt back with us. Uh, they, they, <laughs> if, you, if you're new to us, they, they were here probably over a little over a year ago. They were with us for a year or so uh, doing our 9 a.m. service, sometimes the 11. And so we got the band back together for one week and uh, a wonderful sign. Thank you and, and, and praise uh, the Lord for your voice this morning. Um, as we get into uh, this uh, sermon time today, uh, we're continuing uh, talking about King David. We're finishing up with, uh, we're in the portion of the Bible that is finishing King David's reign and, 
and now to his son Solomon. Uh, and I got to tell you, I promise you, when you hear this sermon, I did not know I was going to get a brick as a gift. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, similarities to that gift and this sermon today about foundations. And, and so I encourage you to, to listen for them. And I promise you, that was a Holy Spirit thing. Um, in his later years, King David uh, faced uh, significant turmoil uh, in his family and in the nation. And this, of course, is because of his sin with Bathsheba that we spoke about a few weeks back. And it, a lot of this turmoil came from uh, his sons. Uh, Absalom was his third son, and he rebelled. Uh, he declared himself king in Hebron, and this actually forced uh, David to flee Jerusalem for a time, and this rebellion ended up uh, into a civil war and uh, resulted in Absalom's death, leaving uh, David just completely grief-stricken and broken. Later, during David's final days, another son, Ad 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 Adonjai, Ad I can never pronounce that name, Ad 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 Adonjai, Adonjai, uh, attempted to seize the throne. You know what I mean, right? Uh, supported by some king, king, uh, key figures named Joab and Abitar. You can read about them in, in the end of uh, 2 Samuel. Um, however, uh, the prophet Nathan intervened in this uh, incident, reminding David that uh, he had uh, promised that... Um, Solomon would be king, uh, that's Bathsheba's uh, son, and that Solomon would succeed him. And so because of this uh, attempt to seize the throne, um, David had to act swiftly and he anointed Solomon as king. Uh, And uh, Solomon's rise was initially peaceful, uh, but he soon had to consolidate the powers and neutralize his rivals, and one of those rivals was his half-brother, Adojai, and uh, Solomon had him executed. Uh, Do you remember a few weeks back how we talked about David being confronted by Nathan about his sin with Bathsheba, and he tells him this, this parable story about the rich man taking the poor man's beloved lamb and using it for a uh, meal, and David gets really mad and he says that the rich man is going to restore that four times. He's going to restore the lamb fourfold, he says, to the poor man. And then it's revealed to David that the rich man is actually him in the story. Well, that's exactly what David uh, pays for his sin. He pays fourfold for his sin. And um, That means because of the sin with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah, David loses four of his sons. Uh, Four sons. The first son born to Bathsheba, uh, who was part of the adulterous act, was died immediately. Abnon uh, was killed by Absalom. Absalom was killed by David's own men because of this civil war that he caused. And now finally, Adojai is executed on Solomon's orders. So fourfold payment, four sons do die. Before his death, David summons Solomon and he gives him some final words of wisdom that David, at the end of his age, had unfortunately gained at a great cost. David knows the consequences of his sin, and so he lets Solomon know uh, that the kingdom that he's about to uh, receive depends not on military might or political strategy, but simply on one's faith and dedication to God and God's Torah. He says in the words that I read for you a moment ago, he says, be strong, be courageous, and keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in all of his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses so that you may prosper in all that you do. Keep it all 
build it with the Lord. Then in verse 10, it says that David dies. Simply says David slept with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. The last words to his son, build it with the Lord. Keep his commandments. The time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years, and, and now we move on to Solomon's reign. King Solomon ascended to Israel's throne at a very young age. Uh, many scholars believe it was as young as 20 years old. Uh, Solomon was a wise man for his age. Of course, he had a very stressful childhood dealing with all the troubles that were brought upon him by all these indiscretions of his father. And it led to all this unrest from his brothers and war and even death of his four brothers, one in which he had killed himself. So because of this, Solomon was a man who grew wise before his years, uh, having to grow up fairly quickly. And so he gained this great wisdom. He's even credited with, of course, writing the, the book of Proverbs, uh, which is nothing but wisdom statements about how to live your life. And uh, I encourage you to read it. Uh, he's also credited with writing a couple of psalms, including uh, some that were read from Psalm 127, uh, some verses that were read uh, this morning. During his lifetime, his fame as a man of wisdom spread to lands far away. Leaders came from all over to hear him speak this wisdom. When it, There's even scripture of the Queen of Sheba, which was uh, uh, in, a, in southern Arabia, modern-day Yemen, who had come uh, to, the, to test his wisdom, and he answered all of her questions with ease, it says. Um, Early on in Solomon's 40-year reign, uh, there just became great material wealth because of all of his wisdom, spiritual growth in Israel as well. Solomon was responsible with his wisdom for organizing treaties between nations, which opened up trade routes and for commercial goods, and it just led to this great wealth uh, for the nation of Israel. But what Solomon was what most uh, famous for, uh, of course, we all know this, is that he was made famous because he constructed the first temple, the big temple. Uh, foundations of this temple are still there today. Big stones. Is, I don't know how big, but they seem as big as a football field, these stones. Some believe the workforce was 30,000 men just employed to cut timber, 80,000 men to cut stones, 70,000 men who uh, were laborers and supervisors, just uh, an enormous undertaking. It took seven years to build and was known the world over for its elaborate craftsmanship and beauty. It was just a, uh, a huge construction project. And when I read Psalm 127, and I hear those words from Psalm 127, I can't help but think that maybe Solomon was looking at the temple's construction when he pens that psalm. But also, I, I can't help but think that he's listening to uh, his father's final words to him. Uh, the first verse of the psalm uh, has this construction theme, right? Unless the Lord builds the house... Those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Maybe as he writes it, he also sees all, all the time and effort that it's taking to build and is getting caught up in all the excitement around its construction. But then again, Solomon was a wise man, and he wants to learn from his father's mistakes and take his advice. And he sees the enormity of the undertaking, and he sees that all of this is a futile endeavor unless it is done in the right way and for the right reasons, unless the Lord is the foundation of everything. This temple, this country, this office of king, this family of mine, unless the Lord is those foundation bricks of everything that we build, everything that we do means nothing and it will crumble if we are not building it with God at the center of it. Solomon was a wise, wise man. I feel that this psalm, this 
particular wisdom, uh, this period of God's righteous growth of the holy kingdom through his holy people Israel, it has this distinct prophetic words for all Christians throughout all times. Because you see, we live in a time, uh, maybe a culture that values achievement and success and where a person's value is judged by his or her commitment to, in many ways, how much they produce in life, how many degrees they have, how much money they earn, what kind of uh, career they have. But this psalm says to us that true achievement is only gained in how much you build your life on God. Whatever house you are trying to build, a family, a career, a community, a church, whatever house that you claim you are building, it is only successful in the end if it has God at its heart, at its foundation, behind it. It doesn't make a difference how much energy we use to toil it. It doesn't make a difference if we find ways to squeeze more time and be more efficient out of each day. It doesn't make a difference if we start our day before sunrise. God must always be the beginning, the middle, and the end of the lives that we build in the days that we live. And oh, how I wish I had learned that lesson as a young man, I wish I was wise like Solomon when he was young. I mean, I almost died. I literally came this close to death, a few inches either way, trying to gain more and more and more. Not given a care in the world how God fit into all that. I really did. You know, when you think back to moments of your life and they just kind of make you cringe at the kind of person you were and you kind of shut those moments off. I know we all have the, I hope we all have those moments because I sure do. Uh, I honestly do wish that I had been uh, a better example of a man that put God first when my sons were small. Um, you know, you wonder how uh, you hurt them you know, with your ignorance and uh, sometimes stupidity. And you try to make up for it for years later. You try to build that foundation years later and you, you realize that uh, uh, maybe there's always going to be a few bricks missing because you didn't build it early. Because the foundation you set when you were young uh, is the foundation and there's no going back. They are hard lessons to learn when you are older, and I wish I had Solomon's wisdom when I was young. And what, and what I can say, <laughs> uh, what I'm about to say, I guess you could say, is I've been guilty in one way or another of, of all of these things. Uh, I just want to give some Solomon wisdom to all of you that are, uh, especially you that are building families uh, at this time. Wisdom that goes out to maybe that workaholic parent who thinks that they are sacrificing their time with their family to provide when providing means the ability to provide every single material thing that the family wants. Not what the family needs, but what the family wants. Talking to you. Or the parents that uh, allow their children to be raised 12 hours a day on social media. Or the parent that's too worn out at the, the end of the day to pray with their children when they tuck them in at night. Or the parent that feels too uncomfortable to pray in front of their children. You know, I struggle with that even to this day. I'm a pastor, and I feel uncomfortable praying with my children sometimes. Hmm. Need to repent of that. Or the parent that, or the husband or wife maybe that's too prideful or too caught up in their own need for receiving respect that they refuse to forgive and will never say I'm sorry or the, the parent that sees God and church as an optional activity 
And this just doesn't mean families too. This means individuals as well, right? This, this psalm is for the individual. So to the individual out there that chases nothing but material gain, you know, the one who dies with the most toys wins. That's the, the motto. And since I'm a grandfather and I say this to my own children, take this, or I want to say this, take this from Solomon's wisdom. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Those are very important words. Think of them. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the guard keeps watch in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. Without God... It is easy for our guards to go down and the gates of our houses to be open to all kind of worldly sins. Things that will cause our houses, if we don't watch, to just crumble away because we didn't build the foundation right. And that last part, your house crumbling away, you know who knew this more than anyone? Solomon did. Because even King Solomon didn't listen to his own wisdom. Near the end of his life, he somehow lost the wisdom of his youth and he stopped putting God first. And he let things trickle into his own house that caused his own destruction. The the book of Ecclesiastes is really all about the world's wisest man and how he became a pathetic figure in his old age. Because of Solomon's trade agreements with other nations, a large number of foreign pagan believing women become part of Solomon's court. Solomon allows them to practice their pagan religions and these women influenced him and they placed demands upon him so much so that his own faith became very weakened and he found himself a little more and more buying into the practices of those religions. And that's how it starts, you know. It's just a little sin at a time, a little ideology at a time, a little, a little bit of, you know, that, that doesn't sound like a bad idea at a time. A little sin in your house, into your life, and it grows and it grows and it grows into larger and larger sins, and nobody in this room can deny that truth. Solomon's participation in these acts, he'd set a demoralizing example for the nation of Israel, this plus bad decisions, heavy taxation placed upon the people, brought unrest and rebellion to the land, and eventually one of Solomon's servants, Jeroboam, led a successful rebellion against Solomon's son, Rehoboam, after Solomon's son, Rehoboam, ascended to the throne. And the result of this rebellion led to the division of the United Kingdom, led to a division of Solomon's kingdom into two separate nations, the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. Solomon stopped putting God as the foundation. He stopped putting God at the gates and his house crumbled away. Crumbled. And that final thing that we must consider when we think of David's final advice to his son. We have to think of it as our church as well. Not just the kingdom. But that kingdom becomes our church too. This is our temple. This is our sanctuary. This is our little kingdom praising the Lord. And so as members of this church, we must never forget these words as well. As, as with the temple in Solomon's time, it is God who builds this church. Considerable work is required by all of us who love and keep this church going each and every day, but we must not get lost in all of that. 
We must make sure that God and God's ways are always the central focus of all that we do. And I'm not just talking about on Sunday morning. God needs to be first in our Bible studies, in our family ministries, in our preschool, in our dinners, rummage sale, our meetings, and even in our planning of our activities, even in Jumbotron football. (laughs) We need to have God there and pray and call upon the Lord to make it a time in which His Holy Spirit is felt in fellowship and love and glory. If we are not putting God first, if we are not working for God's purposes with all of our toil, if we are not reflecting love, forgiveness, kindness, joy, but also courage and strength and wisdom that honor God and all that we say and all that we do as a church, if we are not reflecting these things, then we labor in vain. And God will not bless this place. The bricks will fall away. Now I know we're on the right path because I've seen the growth in this church in five years. I've seen the growth spiritually, not only numerically, but spiritually. We're on the right path. But we must never forget the words. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. If we forget those words, we too will end up like Solomon, broken, disgraced. Glory be to the Lord our God, who is our foundation, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let us rise for our closing hymn.
And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the love of God, in communion with the Holy Spirit, bless, preserve, and keep all of you, now and forever, and unto ages of ages. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Amen.